greatest parts. Uh, well, uh, just to just to clarify, our vision night is not tonight. If you show up at the church tonight, you uh, there would be no one here. Well, except for my group. If you're in my group, please show up to the church uh, uh, at 5:30. And uh, yeah, but uh, our vision night has been moved to March 7th at 6. So join us for that. Well, I have a sentence for you that is going to invoke emotion inside of your soul. Are you ready for this? The power is out. <laughs> Zoinks. Uh, don't you just feel that? I mean, uh, uh, this sentence provokes a lot of reactions. As you are well aware, an ice storm swept through the Willamette Valley last week. Downed trees, downed power lines, downed uh, internet. It was... A real downer. I'm sorry, guys. I had, I, it is in my contract uh, as being a dad that I have to take advantage of all dad jokes. So, um, <clears throat> no, I, I don't make light of last week because there are still people without power even right now. Over 300,000 PGE customers were uh, affected. That is just mind blowing. Um, so a group of us loaded up chainsaws and, and tr trailers last Saturday, a week ago, um, and uh, uh, to work on a few yards from our congregation. Uh, uh, all of us were well equipped with power tools and more importantly, uh, ibuprofen. That is, that is real. You take it before you start and after you get done. Um, yeah. Uh, after a day's uh, effort, we finished. Are you ready for this drum roll? Three homes. There was a whole group of us, and we got three homes done. All that sweat and manpower dealt with maybe 12 out of the 300,000 300, customers. Um, after days of the almost 900 employees from PGE working on the devastation to the grid, they called for help. They called for help for 1,100 more linemen to come out and help with all of the devastation here. See, uh, still today, many are without power. This outage was not solved by us, a few group of us with a few chainsaws. It wasn't even solved by P PGE over a weekend. It's still going on now. Progress is taking gritty days and weeks trying to restore what has been broken. There has been setback and there has been frustration. Progress, actual progress, is gritty. Progress is hard. Big things cannot be solved by small steps. See, God has not asked me to be a lineman for, for PGE. God has also not asked me to be a lineman for the Seattle Seahawks. Although I could be for the Dallas Cowboys or the San Francisco 49ers because they're, oh yeah, sorry, oh man, yeah. <laughs> oh, whoops a dips. I, I had to take a shot. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it is incredible to watch superhuman athletes compete in their sports. I mean, it is incredible to watch athletes who are at the top of their game uh, be able to show their physical prowess on the field. Uh, watching Michael Phelps in the previous uh, Olympic Games, watching that guy swim as if he is swimming with grade schoolers was incredible. See, everybody loves to watch the uh, action. What is less uh, interesting is to watch the non-glamorous hours of blood, sweat, and tears put into training. Everybody likes to watch the game, but nobody wants to watch practice. Uh, Angela Duckworth, uh, she is a researcher and uh, writer. Um, she, she had a question. She wanted to know this. Who is successful and why? Like in this world, we seem to have successful people and sometimes it doesn't make sense. So who is successful and why are they? After years of research in various fields of uh, employment and life, she started to see a pattern she started to see that those who were particular gritty 
or able to maintain focus and hard work, not just for a few days, but months and years were generally the most successful people in life. Those who could put their nose to the grindstone doing the gritty things day in and day out for months and years uh, would find success in life. In her book, Grit, um, she writes about the legacy of Mark Spitz. Long before Michael Phelps, there was Mark Spitz, the first Olympic swimmer to win seven gold medals in the Olympics in 1972. And does anybody know where that was held? Munich. Munich. Nice. Well done. Uh, she says this. We want to believe that Mark Spitz was born to swim in a way that none of us were and that none of us could. We don't want to sit on the pool deck and watch him progress from amateur to expert. We prefer our excellence fully formed. We prefer mystery to mundanity. We prefer our excellence to be fully formed. See, for example, for those of us who are married or want to be married someday, uh, we want a healthy marriage but we balk when we realize the work it takes to have and to maintain a healthy marriage. Some of us want a healthy retirement or we want a healthy bank account uh, or, or just to be out of credit card debt, but struggle with the sacrifice it takes to live within our means. Things like making our own lunch instead of eating out or riding a bike to work instead of paying on a car loan. Some of us desire a healthy body, but struggle with the day-to-day -day grind of portion control, exercise, and food choices. Can I get an amen? <laughs> yeah. Some of us desire to be extraordinary parents, but struggle with the self-control, the prayer, the devotion, the prayer, and the prayer necessary to guide and shepherd our kids well. Some of us desire to have a deep, enriching relationship with God, yet we struggle with cultivating a regular devotional life through prayer, self-sacrifice, and the daily obedience required to posture ourselves to be changed by the Holy Spirit day in, day out, with grit dedicated to the process. See, Eugene Peterson, well-known and well-loved pastor, he describes spiritual formation as a long obedience, a long obedience in the same direction. Most of life is filled with unse unseen, gritty, mundane moments of obedience that could be easily overlooked by the untrained eye. Today, Nehemiah will help us to understand the importance of, of the mundane and the gritty and the invitation to stay committed when the adversity comes, when the adversity comes. So let's go to prayer. Lord, we submit this morning to you. We submit this teaching to you. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and we are here to sit at your feet and be trained by you. We cannot do this on our own, we can't even think or receive ideas, uh, your truth without the work of your Holy Spirit, God. So, Spirit, open our minds and give us ears to hear what you have for us and the courage to follow through. In Jesus' name, uh, amen. Amen. Well, just to catch you up, we're in the book of Nehemiah. We're uh, in chapter four, and he is working on fortifying and rebuilding the walls of God's city here. Uh, Nehemiah is working hard to move God's people into their preferred future. And uh, Nehemiah, he wrote a book. It's sort of a memoir. Um, and as you read through, it, it kind of reads like that as, as he talks about all the things that he had done. It's from his pers perspective here. So we'll be in Nehemiah chapter four. You, you can follow along inside of your Bible or it'll be up on the screen. Uh, let's notice the responses to adversity. As we dig into the scripture, you're going to see that, that Nehemiah and God's people are experiencing adversity. And like Nehemiah, we are tempted towards despair or apathy when encountering hard times. But to follow through on the messy, long-term, tiresome work of participating with the kingdom of God, it requires something. And you're going to hear me use this word throughout the whole morning. It requires grit. So we're going to start in verse 1 on uh, chapter 4. It says this. San, San Ballot was very angry when he learned that uh, we were rebuilding the wall. 
he flew into a rage and mocked the Jews, saying in front of his friends and the Sumerian army officers, what does this bunch of poor, feeble Jews think they're doing? Do they think they can build the wall in a single day by just offering a few sacrifices? Do they actually think they can make something of stones from a rubbish heap and charred ones at that? See, as a reminder here, Sanballat, he held control. He held power. And to have the Jews rebuilding, he felt threatened by that. The rebuilding of the walls was an affront to his power and control. And man, he use, uses here the age-old adjective a adage of misinformation and creating doubt to discourage God's people. Do they really think they can do that? It kind of reminds me of the serpent in the garden when he was talking to Eve, right? Did God really say that? And he's using this. He's trying to cast doubt on who God is and what he's trying to say. Now notice his question here. Do they think they could build the wall, hear this, in a single day? The plan was never to build the wall in a single day. That's never what God told them to do. That's not the, what they were planning on doing. Nehemiah knew of the long, hard work that was going to have to take, take place. See, the enemy of our souls would love to distract us with the same question, except that we're not building a wall but we're building our lives on the foundation of Jesus. And, and his questions, the enemy of our soul, his questions sound like this. Do you really think that one day of devotions or one prayer time or one com community group or one day of fasting will change your heart and your circumstances? Let's not be distracted by our culture's expectation for immediate results. That if I do something, I need results right now. Let's not be distracted by that. God invites us to the journey, to the journey of discipleship, of obedience, not just a single act. As these single moments, and I've seen it in my, my own life and uh, those those in our congregation that, that as these moments start to stack up on top of each other, we start to see the fruit of what it is to follow Jesus, not just with a single day or a single choice, but a lifestyle of obedience. And the scripture goes on. Tobiah the, the Hamanite who was standing beside him remarked, that stone wall would collapse if even a fox walked along top of it. See, when sand ballots attacks and discouragement, they uh, seem to be effective. His buddy steps in, as all buddies do, to spout off. That stone wall would collapse if even a fox walked on top of it. Yet yeah, modern day uh, archaeology has actually found the wall that they believe to be this wall that Nehemiah was working on here. It'll, it'll be up on the screen, but it was almost nine feet thick. That's a big wall. I don't know how big that fox is, but he'd have to be pretty big to be able to knock that wall down. See, if questioning isn't effective, then outright lies are the very next step. The lies of the enemy start to move towards accusation. It sounds like this. You are not capable of following God. You are not loved. God will never accept you. You will never find a community of faith that would ever want you. Ooh, this one hurts. Things will never change. You don't need to be transformed by Jesus. Your life is fine without the will and ways of Jesus. All of these are false. And I just feel prompted right now to just pray. Lord, we pray against these lies in Jesus' name. Would you cast these down and direct us towards you, your truth? Satan, you have no power in this room or in your people in Jesus' name. All of these are false. God is perfectly suited to transform the repentant heart. He wants you. He loves you. The community of faith desires to commit with and to you. This is for you. He goes on to verse 4. Then I prayed, hear us, our God. For we are being mocked. May their scoffing fall back on their heads and may themselves become captives in a foreign land. Do not ignore their guilt. 
Do not blot out their sins, for they have provoked you to anger here in front of the builders. I want us to catch this. Let's notice this. What does Nehemiah do in the face of uh, opposition? He prays. Nehemiah prays. That's what he does. What is tempting for us to do when we face uh, opposition? We lash out. We complain. We blame others. We shrink. We gossip. All of these are, are understandable. But for the Christian, our first chess move our very first chess move is always prayer. We always need to go to prayer first. By praying first, we admit we do not have all of the answers, that we can't figure it out on our own wisdom and our own thoughts and our own intelligence and our own experience. We admit that we are submitted to God's will, no matter what that would, would be. We submit to God's ways in every situation. We want to move towards silence or violence, and Jesus invites us to pray. That's what God calls his people to. Moving on to verse 6. At last, the wall was completed to half its height around the entire city, for the people had worked with enthusiasm. But when Sanballat and, and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Hashdodites heard that the work was going ahead and that the gaps in the wall of Jerusalem were being repaired, they were furious. They all made plans to come and fight against Jerusalem and throw us into confusion. But we prayed to our God and guarded the city day and night to protect ourselves. Then the people of Judah began to com complain. The workers are getting tired and there is so much rubble to be moved. We will never be able to build the walls by ourselves. Meanwhile, our enemies were saying, before they know what's happening, we will swoop down on them and kill them and end their work. You see, enthusiasm is a wonderful thing. We love it. It motivates so many projects and endeavors. Enthusiasm is the lifeblood of our American culture. Once we get excited to do something, we do it. But enthusiasm was waning for God's people, and they moved from external discouragement to internal. Uh, I would like to tell you a story. When we remodeled our first home, uh, we had our master bath, and I'm using this term master bath very generously. <laughs> uh, it was tiny. It was actually our, uh, our closet now is bigger than our bathroom was at our last house. Uh, and that's not because we have a big closet now. Um, but we decided to remodel this bathroom. And so we started demo. That's the best part, right? You get to rip stuff up. It's the absolute best part. And all of a sudden... What we thought was going to be a weekend project turned into something that was a wee bit more as we found water damage everywhere. Sheetrock was rotted out, the floors. I, I remember trying to chip up tile and all of a sudden my whole, my whole hammer goes straight through, right through the subfloor. And what was a weekend project would take us two years to be able to complete this bathroom right before we actually sold it. Seven of us lived in this house with a single bathroom with six girls inside of the home because enthusiasm had waned for this project. Discouragement had come up. Did it take two years to actually do the work? No. But were we discouraged and thought, we will never be able to do this? See, enthusiasm will fade. For those of you involved in a community group right now, you may be loving your group. You may think, oh man, these people are amazing. These people get me. She's so kind and he is so funny. I love that. I'm here to tell you those feelings will eventually fade. I mean, yeah, you probably have really amazing people inside of your group. But God is creating a community that isn't fueled by enthusiasm, but deep devotion to the kingdom of God and to one uh, another. We have to have something deeper than just we like each other or we're enthusiastic about what God does. Enthusiasm only takes you so far and, and commitment and fidelity picks up where enthusiasm leaves off. 
And unless we can get through this honeymoon stage and say, we are here together for as long as God calls us, as long as it takes, we will never enjoy the fruits of the kingdom. This is what God is doing inside of us. Moving on to verse 12, it says this. The Jews who lived near the enemy came and told us again and again, they will come from all directions and attack us. So I placed armed guards behind the lowest parts of the wall in the exposed areas. I stationed the people to stand guard by families armed with swords, spears, and bows. Then as I looked over the situation, I called together the nobles and the rest of the people and said to them, don't be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord who is great and glorious and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. When our enemies heard that we knew of their plans and that God had frustrated them, we all returned to our work on the wall. But from then on, only half of my men worked while the other half stood guard with spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. The leaders stationed themselves behind the people of Judah who were building the wall. The laborers carried on their work with one hand supporting their load and one hand holding a weapon. All the builders had a sword belted to their side. The the trumpeter stayed with me to sound the alarm. Then I explained to the nobles and officials and all the people, the work is very spread out and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. When you hear the blast of the trumpet, rush to wherever it is sounding, then our God will fight for us. We worked early and late from sunrise to sunset, and half the men were always on guard. You see, Nehemiah and in turn God's people were facing even more adversity, and they began to question their own ability to walk this project out. Could we really do it? See, ironically, Sanballat and Tobiah were right. This is not a project that would be completed by hard work. They were, they were right. Nehemiah re- reminds us that it is God that will fight for us. Our obedience, coupled with the faithfulness of the Lord, will inch us closer to the preferred future of the kingdom of God. God rarely calls us towards outcomes. He calls us to be faithful. How can we be faithful? Also note this, note how flexible they were. They were committed to the project and adversity had brought challenges. By splitting up, they found themselves, I mean, watch this, less efficient. Of course, half the amount of people can only do half the amount of work. But they were still able to crawl their way forward in faithfulness. See, during this season, we have highlighted what God has revealed for new hope during this season. Community, teaching, and practice. Community group, Sunday morning, and daily devotions. Maybe devotions in the morning have been thrown off by a change in your work schedule. Move devotions to the nighttime. Maybe you find yourself sick or having to quarantine for a few weeks. Participate with services online. Maybe your group is not what you expected. The people are not your age or don't think like you or don't have the same interests as you. Be open to what God has ordained for you. Maybe you were unable to sign up for a group for this season. Find a couple of people to discuss the questions each week and to and participate with the daily devotions found at nhgroups.org. Stay devoted. Stay faithful in the face of adversity. In, in, in the words of Angela Duckworth, uh, again, she says this, enthusiasm is common, but endurance is rare. So let's be people of endurance and let's be people of grit. Mm. Here are some questions for you to discuss with your group this week. All of these will be available at nhgroups.org um, for, your, for your group. If you're not in a group, find somebody to be able to talk this stuff out with. As a group, you're going to read through, you're going to read through Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 1 through 21. That's the text we just read through. As a group, uh, you're going to read through Hebrews 12, 1. 
And here are your questions for discussion this week. What is the most difficult thing you've ever uh, had tempted? The hardest thing you've ever done? In what ways did it require perseverance? Next, you will discuss this. How are you doing with your daily de devotion and attending Sunday's service? Uh, and uh, man, just so you know, like all of us are coming to our group with where we are at and who we are. And man, if that is a challenge for you, that's okay, but be honest with that with your group. This is a safe place to be able to share. These are a group of people that are committed to you. How are you doing with that? If it's not going well, what steps can you take to re-engage and commit again? And lastly, discuss with your group. How are you participating with Lent? And this morning, we were invited into this season of uh, Lent. For those of you who know the traditional church calendar, uh, we're starting a few days after the official start, but that's okay. We're all doing it together here. Um, and Lent is an invitation to a process that can be gritty, that can be hard. It's, it's easy at the front end to be enthusiastic about no coffee for weeks and weeks, but for those of us who were without power for a few days, you're trying to figure out how to brew coffee from anything. You're like, I don't know, I can filter it through a sock if that's what it takes. But it requires grit. So remember, we're, we're both going to add something during this time, and, and we're going to fast from something. Uh, there's a link found at nhgroups.org right on the front page. You'll see the same video we showed up here, and as well as a little primer there. And each Sunday, we will celebrate resurrection. And so as we lead up to Easter Sunday, uh, as, as we have a big celebration. But this season will continue to require grit and perseverance. So let's not miss out on what God is doing because we didn't have grit. God is making all things new. Well, I'm going to invite our sports uh, outreach director. His name is uh, Ruben Erickson. He's going to come on up here and share a little bit about a, an opportunity uh, we have. Uh, we continue to invest. Come on. Uh, we continue to invest in our Northeast Salem community here. And for years we've had, if you've seen it, if you drive by at night, it's really hard to miss. <laughs> we have an artificial turf soccer field that is fully lit, and we love to be able to serve them. So we have a low-cost opportunity coming up. Ruben, tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, well, thanks, Chris. Um, well, first of all, good morning, New Hope. Yeah. Thank you, Dania. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as the Church of Christ, uh, we are called to be a people of action and a people of service, and we can honor God by being obedient. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I really love what Pastor Chris, uh, the quote he shared, uh, and I'll pull it up here. Enthusiasm is common, but endurance is rare. And that's something I really struggle with because I can get really excited about things, but when it actually comes and time passes, you just don't feel it anymore, that's when endurance needs to kick in. And so today we have uh, the opportunity to be obedient towards Christ and obe obedient toward the calling he's put on us. Uh, here at New Hope, we're hosting a kids' soccer academy this spring. So that's March 22nd to March 26th. Um, and so I would just like you to be, I would like to invite you to be part of what God is doing on our sports field. And so we have some volunteer opportunities and we have sponsorship opportunities. So let me tell you about um, our volunteer opportunities. This is a way you can serve. So we have, um, we have opportunities like uh, setting up, tearing down, snacks, coaching help. And you know, you don't need to know the first thing about soccer. This isn't just for my soccer people out there. <laughs> you can help and we have tons of ways you can help and not all of it involves actually playing. You know, you can work with kids and you can just be a help. Uh, so I'd really encourage you to, uh, uh, to get in contact with me and I'll share that later. Another way is um, our sponsorship opportunities. Uh, for $25, you can make a kid have a sense of belonging and a sense of being loved by our church along with soccer skills training, and that will pay for the entire camp for them. And now that is a way to demonstrate God's love mm, um, through sponsoring a kid. So I would really encourage you uh, to look into that. And so how you can do that, how you can get more information is you go to inewhope.com and you'll look at the sports... Org. Uh, org. 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 
Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and you click on the kids soccer badge and that should give you um, uh, the information to sign up. And if you have any questions for me, I'm gonna be in the lobby. Um, so I look forward to seeing you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Ruben. Can we thank him for, for joining us? Man, well, God is doing amazing things as we, uh, as we uh, heed the call, as we have uh, hope in here. So I would encourage you, this is how we love our Northeast Salem community here, one of the many ways. So get signed up for that. Get signed up for the food pantry. We are the hands and feet. Well, I'm going to invite you to stand, and I would love to pray over you as you go. And uh, yeah. Ah. Uh, well, Lord, we thank you for this morning, God. We're submitted to you. Thank you for this ancient rhythm, Lord, of gathering as your church, Lord, as we sit under your teaching, Lord, as, as we worship you, as we fellowship. God, thank you for this. God, and I ask you bl bless each and every person in this room and listening online. Would you continue to call us into deeper and deeper waters, deeper uh, commitment, Lord, to your will and your ways, and empower us. We cannot do this, God. It's because you are for us. We trust you in Jesus' name. Uh, amen. Amen. All right. We will see you next week. Thanks. <laughs>